Hello everyone, my name is Josh with the Niles Main District Library and welcome to my second series of videos on Windows 10 and this is going to be Windows 10 Intermediate where I'm going to build upon what I taught you guys in Windows 10 Basics. You know, I'm going to go into much more depth about what I talked about in Windows 10 but also introduce a couple new things in regards to Windows 10. And not only that, but again, I'm going to go with the same structure of showing you guys a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation on Windows 10 and go into depth about what I'm going to talk about, but then have a second video that's actually going to show my desktop and give you guys a live demonstration of how to do the certain things and access the certain things that I'm going to show you within this presentation. So let's get started and I'm going to talk about the five items on the agenda next. All right, so moving on to the agenda, these are the five items on the agenda. So first and foremost, I'm going to describe to you guys how to actually go about installing programs and the two major ways you would go about installing programs. Also, a few tips for installing these programs to make sure that you're not installing programs that are not legitimate, as well as maybe installing some type of malicious software on your system. Next, I'm going to go over how to uninstall programs, which is a fairly simple process. And then the third item on the agenda, I'm going to go over the various settings of Windows 10. Again, whereas the previous Windows 10 Basics video, I described how to access your system settings. Now I'm actually going to go into a bit more depth about these various settings, touch upon a few of them, but then a few of the other settings, I'm going to actually go into much more depth about those. And then the fourth item on the agenda is going to be Task Manager. You know, again, just touched upon that briefly in Windows 10 Basics but didn't go into too much depth other than how to close programs that were kind of freezing and hanging. Whereas now I'm actually going to describe to you guys the other really cool features of Task Manager. And the last item on the agenda is going to be Windows Defender, which is basically the built-in Windows antivirus software that they have. Uh, but it's not only antivirus, it provides browser protection and other forms of protection that I'm going to get into when I discuss that. So the first thing we're going to start off with is how to install programs next. All right, so moving on to installing programs. So installing programs is fairly simple and there's two major ways to do this. So the first way is simply put, go directly to that company's website who has the program that you want and download it directly from them. Fairly simple, there's typically three basic steps with this. Most programs installations, again, are gonna follow these same basic steps. First, you would go to the website and download the program. And again, for a lot of these bigger companies and these more well-known programs, it's very, very simple when you go to their websites. Typically, they have it a huge download button like Google Chrome has, and a lot of other websites will have just huge, you know, bold text and things like that saying download here, you know, and you just click that button and it will typically download the program automatically for you directly to your web browser. And as you can see with Google Chrome, it will show up on the bottom of the screen and it says like Chrome setup.exe has finished downloading and it would let you know when the download's finished. And that's where it gives you options. You can run the program, open the folder that it downloaded it to, or actually view all your downloads. So you would just click the run button. And what it does is it then runs the program's installation wizard, which essentially goes through the various steps that you would need to actually fully install the program to your computer system. So again, that's where you just follow the prompts in the installation window until it finishes completely, and then you can click run and it would run that program. And then again, after you are done actually fully installing the program to your computer system, you know, as I talked about in Windows 10 Basics, you can essentially create shortcuts to that program. You can create a shortcut on your desktop, the taskbar, you can make this program as a tile, you know, and then you could easily access it from whatever option that you choose. But that is the first way that you would actually install a program, directly downloading it from that company's website. All right, so moving on, I'm actually gonna show you guys what the uh, typical installation wizard looks like for a program. So this uh, example here is Malware Bytes, which is a antivirus program. And as you can see, you know, you'd click free download, click this link right here, it should typically download it automatically, and then you'd click to run it, and this is what would pop up. This is what a typical installation wizard looks like for the vast amount of programs out there, though some programs could have additional you know, windows that show additional things that you could add you know, within the installation. But this is what would typically show up. You know, you'd select your language, you would click next, and for the vast amount of installations, you typically just keep clicking next until it gets to you know this window right here, which says to install it. So you'd click install, 
it would install it and then you can click finish and that's how the vast amount of programs are really simple you typically just click next for all of them but again if you look closer you know these first three you can click next you know this is just a license agreement that you have to agree to in order to install it there's more information click next to that now these are certain windows where if you knew more about a computer system and what you were doing this is where you could actually change it so you could select the actual destination folder typically windows will automatically put the program into the program files folder in windows and just install it within there but you could change that by clicking this browse button right here and you can actually choose a specific folder that you wanted the program to install to but again that's really only if you want to change that a lot of these you don't have to change and you can just click next and windows will automatically you know choose the folder for you and even this one you can select a start menu folder that you want to have a shortcut in you can do that or even just have a desktop shortcut as you can see right here you can check mark this box and it will actually create a desktop shortcut these are typically the only windows that you could actually customize and change for the installation you know whether you wanted to create a shortcut for the program or not or whether you wanted to change the actual folder it gets installed into but for the vast amount you know you typically would just keep clicking next until you get to here you can click install and it shows you you know the options that you chose and you can go back click the back button in the installation wizard to change those but you can just click install and it will show you the installation progress a green bar you know will show you the actual progress that the installation is at and once it's done this window would pop up you know setup is finished and you can click finish and most programs will just automatically launch the program as soon as you click finish and you're done installing the program now one thing I would actually be weary of is some programs what they have is they'll have like a window that basically says oh do you want to also install search engines and these search bars that you can add to your browser like a lot of programs have that and it's really annoying because a lot of people don't actually need those or want them and one of the big things is they don't notice they just do it as I said they just keep clicking next but they don't see that option you know for instance I've had a few programs that essentially automatically try to install Yahoo's search bar on my browser which I don't want because I just use Google so be careful with that if it has that and it has it check marked you can uncheck that uh, so that it doesn't install this additional software that you don't want but that's the only thing that I would say to watch out for when you're installing programs is watch out for this window that may want to install an additional program as opposed to just the program that you want now the second major way to actually install programs on your Windows 10 PC is to just simply put use the Windows Store so the way that you would access that is right here there's a tile for the Windows Store and it will say store you can just click that and it launches the Windows Store uh, but when the Windows Store is always going to be pinned by default on your taskbar as well so it will show like a little bag and then the Windows logo on it and that's the Windows Store and if you click that this is what the Windows Store looks like and it's really really simple to actually install an application through the Windows Store you would just click on that application for instance Netflix right here and there will be an option that says get and you just click get and it basically will install that program onto your system automatically and what's really nice again with the Windows Store it will tell you you know whether the program is free or not and it will tell you the pricing of it there's uh, reviews for these applications which is really nice you know you don't typically get reviews if you were to go straight to the manufacturers website to download their software whereas the Windows Store it has these additional you know features of being able to also share it if you wanted to share it with a friend and send it to them or again I think one of the best ones is just these reviews you know seeing whether this program actually works properly with you know Windows 10 PCs or not and, and that's really the other way and one very important thing if you were going to get applications through the Windows Store is you do have to have a Microsoft account so just realize that you know you have to actually sign in with your Microsoft account in order to get applications from the Windows Store and one last thing is this a lot of people do try to go to the Windows Store and just get applications through the Windows Store itself because it is safer you know before applications get onto the Windows Store you know they have to be processed and reviewed by Microsoft you know in order to make sure that they're safe and legitimate so that's another reason why you would actually choose a Windows Store you know and getting applications that way as opposed to going directly to these websites of these companies and getting it through there 
So next, we're going to move on to uninstalling programs and applications, which is fairly simple, and I'll talk about that next. So uninstalling programs and applications is fairly simple. You know, all you have to do is this, get to the apps and futures window, as you can see to the right right here. So you can do that a couple ways. You know, you could just go to the all system settings window, and then from there, as you can see, click system and it will bring up this window, which it typically starts on display, but then you could just click apps and futures and it takes you to the apps and futures window and it will list them all. Now, the other way you simply put easiest way is just go to the search bar and type in apps and futures and it will bring it up. And this is what you should see, a whole list of your apps and futures and to uninstall one that you don't want, really, really simple, you just click directly on it like Google Chrome and it will give you these two options, modify or uninstall. And you would just click uninstall to completely uninstall that program. Now it's really, really important and something that you should do when you get a new Windows 10 laptop or PC to uninstall programs immediately when you boot up your system and you're logging in for the first time to, again, uninstall programs that you know you're not gonna use, especially like Windows 10. It comes with a lot of games that a lot of people just don't use games like candy crush and other like kind of mobile games that are really popular for whatever reason you know they come pre-installed on a lot of windows 10 systems so you could just uninstall all those right away and what's really important is doing it through this apps and futures window because if you were to uninstall a program by just trying to go through the file system and then trying to just delete that folder that has that program the thing with that is it may not completely get rid of all the files associated with that program. The program could be using files that are actually located in different folders. So that's why when you do the uninstall you know, process through the apps and futures window, it fully gets rid of the program and any files that that program is using so that, it, again, you don't have any like lingering files that are just taking up space on your hard drive that don't need to be. So one last tip when it comes to uninstalling programs and applications is this. Make sure you avoid uninstalling drivers and other necessary programs. So these are some examples. So like Adobe Acrobat Reader and a lot of Adobe applications and futures do not uninstall those. Those are needed, especially Adobe Acrobat Reader is needed to actually view PDF files. So you do not want to delete those. Also, if ever you see this Intel processor graphics, don't delete that. So what that is, is that is the actual necessary drivers and programs needed so that you can actually display images on your monitor that you're using. So don't get rid of that. That's important. If you see anything regarding Java, don't get rid of that as well. Java is needed to properly view web applications and have web applications work. So do not delete anything with that. And then if you see something like this, real tech high definition audio driver, or really anything that says audio driver, do not delete that as well. That is for your sound. If you delete that, your sound probably will not work after that. So be very careful. And if you see anything with driver, just try to leave that alone until you can actually do your research properly and see if you actually need uh, those drivers and programs or not. But these are some of the basics of just, again, avoid uninstalling drivers and necessary programs like these because your system may not function properly or you, know, you may not be able to actually open certain file types. So be very careful with that. But next, we're gonna actually move on to settings and I'm gonna go into much more depth about the various settings Windows 10 has to offer. So just a quick recap, uh, the way that you would access all your system settings is if you were to click the start menu button in the lower left corner of Windows and just click this gear button and bam, it brings up the main window that allows you to access all your system settings. So we're gonna start with first clicking system. So within this window, you can change options regarding your display notification, apps, and power. So this is what would show if you click system, and I'm gonna get into that right now. So this is what it shows when you click system, it automatically goes to display first, and this interface is gonna be different today for Windows 10. There have been uh, several updates that have added more options and things like that. And I'm gonna show you guys what an updated Windows 10 display you know, settings window would look like and the various options it has. But these are some of the basic options, you know, so as you can see, you can actually change the size of text applications and other items and make them bigger if you wanted to. 100% is recommended. That's basically 100% is just going to show you what your actual screen resolution is and the sizes of text and things like that based on your resolution. 
Whereas if you change this, you can make it bigger. Now the main reason you'd want to change this is if you had a monitor that had a fairly high resolution. You know, for instance, I actually have a 4K monitor at home. And what happens is with this higher resolution, a lot of the icons and actual pictures of things and text is really kind of small. So, you know, on my home PC, actually, I have this at 150% because it allows me to see these things a lot better and they're not so small. So that's really the main reason why you'd want to change this. Again, if you had poor eyesight and you just wanted to make it bigger and easier to see, you could do that and various things like that. Now, right under is orientation. So this is the actual orientation of what the picture would be based on how you choose it. So landscape is typically the default. And this is what you would keep it at if you had a regular laptop or desktop computer, just keep it at landscape, you know, but you could change it to portrait mode if need be. The, the only reason why you would change the orientation is if you had like a hybrid laptop uh, tablet and you know a lot of these you can actually detach the keyboard and just use the actual screen as a tablet so that's why you would have this option to change the orientation so you can change it to portrait to landscape to better fit how you're actually going to hold the uh, tablet pc you know if you had one of those so that's why that's there but again there's advanced display settings and things like that that i'm going to go into in much more depth when i actually have my second video and show you guys a demonstration of this stuff and how it actually changes well, uh, is what I'm going to show you guys as well. All right, so moving on, next we're going to talk about the default apps. So the default app settings basically will show you a list of all the major types of files that you can open, whether it be you know music and audio files, photos, videos, your web browser, email. This settings menu allows you to choose what default application you want to use to open up these certain types of files. So with Windows 10, you're going to have Microsoft's own built-in applications to open this. But again, you could always change this just in case, you know, you know, the main reason why you would change this is only if you have a certain, say, like audio program or photo program that is much more advanced or has additional features and things like that, or you just are having issues trying to open up like a photo, that's when you could choose a different default app and see if it actually opens up in that application. And if it does, you can set the photos to open in this different default application. So that way, you know, you don't have future issues with opening up those certain types of photos or videos that you couldn't open up with Microsoft's own built-in, you know, audio or uh, photo applications. So uh, you can also do things like choose, again, the default email program you're using, the default web browser and things like that, which is really nice. All you would do is literally just click on, see how it says default email, the plus, and then you can choose the program that you have installed to be the default like email program, for instance. Now, just know if, if you want to choose the default application, you do have to have it installed before you can actually choose it as the default application. So if I didn't have Firefox or Google Chrome installed yet, these options wouldn't show up and it would just be Microsoft Edge that would show up. And again, even if it has an application that it says is the default, if you just click it, like if I just click Maps, I would still be able to choose from a list of applications that I had installed of what I want to be the default application that opens up this type of file. So really simple. And next we're going to be moving on to the power and sleep settings options. So moving on to the power and sleep options. So this is what the power and sleep options window would look like. So it typically just gives you two basic options. So what this option is, is when plugged in, turn off after, and it says never right here, but if you click this down arrow, it gives you options to like turn your screen, because it has screen here, turn your screen off after like five, 10 or 15 minutes of inactivity. That's what that option does. So you can set it to where, again, this is set to never, but you can set it to where you know, if I leave my computer system and I have not moved my mouse or typed anything on the keyboard, you know, after this certain period of inactivity, it will turn my screen off. And you could do the same thing, but putting your system into sleep mode. So when plugged in, the PC will go to sleep after a certain amount of minutes of inactivity, or you can do never. I would just recommend putting this to like 10 or 15 minutes so that it does turn off your screen or put your computer system into sleep mode. If you did put it into sleep mode, you wouldn't need to mess with the screen settings because when it goes into sleep mode, it will turn off your screen automatically. But the main thing is 
I would do this because it does save power. You know, you don't want to be wasting power if you're not going to be actually using it. Now, if you click additional power settings right here, this is where it actually takes you to certain plans. So the default plan that it has on is balanced, recommended, and as you can see, it just automatically balances the performance with energy consumption on your capable hardware of your computer system, the actual physical components of your system. But you can change this. I honestly wouldn't change this. Balanced is what you should just keep it at. It's what works best for the vast amount of people. But you could do high performance, which favors performance, but it is going to use more power. And again, that's really high performance is only if you know you're going to be doing a lot of, you know, power hungry and really uh, high performance capable applications and you're going to be using them like that. That's when you can choose that. Or if you really want to go power save mode and save as much power as you possibly can, you can go to this power saver option right here. Really, again, the preferred power plan is up to you, but I would just keep it as balanced because, you know, it's what the vast amount of plans are and it really doesn't consume that much power if you're not using your computer system that much. So next we are going to move on to if you were to click on the devices option in the main window settings window and this is again Bluetooth devices, printers, your mouse and so forth and I'm going to start with the mouse and touchpad next. Okay, so once you get into these main device settings window, again, it gives you various options. You can, this is where you would come to manage your printers and scanners, other connected devices, like if you had headphones connected, whether it be wired or wireless, and other types of devices, your mouse and touchpad, which is I'm gonna talk about next, uh, your keyboard, autoplay devices, you know, like music players and stuff like that, and also USB devices. But specifically, I'm gonna go over the mouse and touchpad options right now, so again, this first option, select your primary button. This is basically where you can choose whether it's the left button or the right button on your mouse as being the primary button. Again, for the vast amount of individuals, the primary button is going to be the left button. Most people use a mouse with the right hands and the left button is the main button that you would use to make selections. And then when you click the right button, you know, it typically brings up a context menu or a little pop up menu. Now again, if you were left-handed and you actually wanted to use a mouse with your left hand, that's when you can actually change this and make it so that the right button is the primary button and the left button is for bringing up the little menu. Now this option right below, roll the mouse wheel to scroll, basically the middle button on the mouse, you know, the scroll button, when you pull it back, it scrolls. This makes it so it, it can go faster. So if I was like reading an article on a web page, Basically, since it's multiple lines at a time, you can actually choose how many lines it scrolls each time you, you know, are using the scroll button. So if it's really slow and you're like, ah, this is way too slow, you know, and I'm scrolling and it just, I'm reading faster than what it's scrolling, then you could change this to go faster. Or again, if it's going too fast and it's scrolling through way too many lines at a time, you can change this to make it go slower. You know, it's really up to you how you want to do that. Now this option right here, and again, if you click multiple lines at a time, you can actually choose the amount of lines to scroll each time. Now this option right below here, scroll inactive windows when I hover over them. So that is on by default. And what that is, is basically an example I can give is this. Say I have two windows open. So I have a Word document open where I'm actually taking notes of a textbook I'm reading. And then the other window is that actual electronic, you know, textbook, and I'm reading through it as I'm taking notes. So the main window that I have open is my Word document, you know, I'm taking notes in it. So if this was set to off, and I wanted to actually scroll down in the actual window that I have my book in and scroll down the page, I'd have to click that window that has my book in it, and then I'd be able to scroll down. And then I'd have to go back to my Word document and click back into there so that I can start typing into the Word document again and start typing my notes. So with this option on, it makes it so I never have to actually click into the window that has my you know, electronic book that I'm reading, and I can just hover my mouse over that window and I can still scroll down in that book without having to actually click it. So this is really nice if you have multiple windows open. And again, something like especially you're taking notes and you don't wanna have to click into that other window in order to scroll down in it, because then you're gonna have to click back into the notes, you know, the Word document you're doing to start typing your notes again. You know, this is one of the main options that you have 
for Windows that allows you to not have to deal with that. And lastly is the additional mouse options. If you click this you know, link right here, it brings you to more mouse options and properties. I honestly would not touch this unless you had issues with your mouse. You know, For instance, select a pointer speed. This is how fast the actual cursor moves on the screen. Again, if it's too slow or too fast, you can adjust it here. And then there's several other options. You know, these are really just up to you if you want to actually use them. I'm not going to go into too much depth about these, but mainly, yeah, this is the main option you would choose if you got the additional mouse options is you can actually change the speed of this pointer right here. But next, we are going to move on to the start menu. So this is you know the menu that contains your all app list and the tiles and I'm going to talk about some of the options you have for customizing the start menu. Which again, this would be done through the personalization options. If you go to the Windows settings main, you know, window, you click personalization and it brings up these options and you click start to then personalize your start menu. And we'll talk about that next. When it comes to customizing the start menu, uh, well, so first and foremost, I'm not going to talk about, you know, background colors, the lock screen or themes, because when you click into those, those are pretty self-explanatory, the options that it gives you and how you can actually customize the look of your system and so forth. When it comes to the start menu, I'm going to go over these options and what exactly they mean. So when you click, uh, which is off by default, show more tiles, if I were to turn that on, basically, as you see in the start menu, it would be able to expand this start menu to the right and be able to show more tiles to the right. Now, you could literally do this manually. I don't even think you need to have this option on because you can literally just hover your mouse over to like this edge and it should change the mouse pointer. And when it changes it, you can click and hold and like drag this out so that, you know, it extends here and you don't have to like scroll down and most of your tiles then uh, take up most of the start menu. But again, that's just if you just turn this on, it will allow you to do that. And then the next option is occasionally show suggestions and start. These are just helpful tips, you know, that Microsoft includes and displays to you. I have that turned off. You know, it's really only if you are very new to Windows 10 and these systems and you want these occasional tips on, you know, various things you can do with it or how to access certain things, then you could have that on and these uh, tips will show up. So if you have the show most used apps on, basically it's going to show you the most used apps in the all apps list to the left. It's going to be like the top option. It will say most used and it will show you like five or more apps that you know you use the most, which is nice. If you want quick access to them, you can have that. Use the start full screen. What that does is when I, if I were to click the start menu button, instead of just, as you see here, taking up a little bit of the left half of the screen, it would literally be the full screen. The start menu, it would show all apps list and all your tiles and it would take up the entire screen. So that's one you know thing that you can do if you want to have that. And then lastly is show recently opened items in jump lists on the start or taskbar. Uh, so what this is, is uh, you know, an icon on the taskbar, you know, on the bottom, for instance, if I were to right click it, what a jump list does is it typically just shows you used pages within that program. So like if I right clicked Google Chrome in the taskbar, the icon for it, it would show me, you know, the last few web pages that I vis visited. You know, that's what the jump list does, it would just show you the last few pages of that application, the last few things you were doing on that application for easy access. Now, if you click this option right here, choose which folders appear on start, you can actually choose which folders appear in the start. Now, I'm gonna show you this in my demonstration, but it would show like to the left of the all apps list. So like where the power button was, for instance, in the settings button, as I talked about, uh, you can actually choose different options. You can show give you quick access to your documents, your downloads folder, music, pictures, file explorer, and stuff like that. So you can turn these on and it will show those options on the left and allow you just quick access to those options. So next we're going to talk about the taskbar and the various things that you can do to customize the taskbar. Okay, so with the taskbar, I'm going to go through each option. So the first option is lock the taskbar, you know, and if you have that on, what that does is this. It essentially does what it says it's going to do. It locks the taskbar so you cannot move the taskbar and you cannot resize it. So, you know, you can't move it to the left, right, or top of your screen. You can't increase or decrease the size of the taskbar and its icons. You know, that's what locking the taskbar does. 
And the, the, the main reason why you would want to do that is really just, again, if you want to make sure it just stays that size or if someone else were to use your computer system, you didn't want them messing with that, you can click lock the taskbar and turn that on. Now the next option, automatically hide the taskbar in desktop mode. You know, if you turn that on, basically it does exactly what it says it's going to do. It's going to hide the taskbar and its buttons and everything like that until all you have to do to bring the taskbar back up and, you know, that whole menu below is just move your mouse pointer to the bottom of the screen and it pops it right back up. The only main reason you'd want to do that is if you had, you know, again, like a nice desktop background and you just wanted it to show that background and be as minimalist as possible and just have, you know, a lot less buttons and icons on your screen and so forth. That's when you can do that. Now, the third option is automatically hide the taskbar in tablet mode. Again, this is really only if you have a tablet or like a hybrid laptop tablet. When you're using it as a tablet and you have it in tablet mode, it will automatically hide the taskbar until again, if you just like click on the bottom where it should be, it will pop up the taskbar again and you can click on its buttons and use anything you want with the taskbar. You know, again, it just makes it easier and hides it so that, you know, you don't have to see it if you don't want to see it. Then you can use small taskbar buttons, uh, turn that on, and it just does exactly what it says. You know, it just makes the taskbar icons and buttons smaller. Now the peak feature, use peak to preview the desktop when you move your mouse to the show desktop button at the end of the taskbar. Uh, so basically the show desktop button is all the way to the right of the taskbar, and I will show you guys this button in my demonstration. But if you were to click that button, it basically minimizes all your windows that you have open and applications you have open and it shows your desktop. Now with the, this peak feature, you don't actually have to click the show desktop. If you just hover your mouse over it, it will show you your desktop. So you can utilize that as well. Uh, now this next option, which is replace the command prompt with PowerShell in the menu when I right click the start button or press Windows key plus X. Don't worry about this. I would not mess with this. Uh, you can just keep that off for now. Uh, as well as show badges on taskbar buttons, you don't have to worry about that as well. And these last two items, you know, again, so taskbar location on the screen, you can change the location of the taskbar. It doesn't have to be on the bottom of the screen. It could be to the right, it could be to the left, it can be up top. It, it's really dependent on your personal preference. And also certain applications, you know, that people use, it actually may be helpful to put it in a different location. But it's really, again, dependent on your needs. And then the last item is combine taskbar buttons and it gives you a drop down menu, which I'll show you the various options in my demonstration, but when taskbar is full. So basically what this does is say I have tons and tons of Word documents open and other programs and applications open. What it does, for instance, is if it is filling up my taskbar and there's no more room, so when the taskbar is full, it combines all of those different Word documents that I have open into just one icon, you know, the Microsoft Word icon in my taskbar. And then when I hover over that, then it shows all my open documents for Microsoft Word, as opposed to like it actually showing all the individual documents open in the taskbar. So that's why you would do that. Again, it's gonna make much more sense when I show you guys these options through a demonstration you'll actually get a visual of how it changes you know the actual environment of windows 10 and the taskbar and the various applications you're using so next we are going to move on to task manager that will be next on the agenda all right so i know i talked about task manager in my windows 10 basics video but i'm going to go into a bit more depth about task manager now so just to recap, you know, to actually open Task Manager, you can just right click uh, a black area on the taskbar and Task Manager would be an option and you just click it, left click it, and it would open. So when it opens, this is like the first time you open Task Manager, this window to the left right here is what you would see. It's basically the basic view of Task Manager that only shows you open applications that you have. And, you know, again, this is really nice if you have an application that's not responding or it's kind of freezing up. You know, you can click it right here, and then once you click it, this end task button would be something that you could click. Then afterwards, you'd click it, and it would completely close that program that's kind of stalling or hanging, which is really nice for troubleshooting. Now, when you click more details, this is when it actually opens up, 
you know, the full blown view of Task Manager and shows you all the major features that Task Manager has to offer, uh, which are right here, all these tabs, processes tab, performance, your app history, startup, users, details, and services, which I'm only going to go into a bit more depth about processes and performance mainly, and then talk about startup after that. So again, it will show you your open applications right here. And what's better is when you click the more details again, it shows you, you know, how much utilization each one of these applications is using of like your CPU, your memory, your hard drive. And if it was like you were using a web browser, it would say how much network usage it's using. So this is really nice because you can come here and look and see, you know, oh, if my computer's kind of slowing down, you know, what application is causing this, you know, what is, you know, taking up the most usage of my CPU, of my memory, and so forth. And right below is where you can see background processes. Again, these are programs that are essentially running in the background that a lot of them are needed to support your system, as well as certain applications. I would not mess with any of these in these background processes. Just leave them be because a lot of them are for your system and they're, you know, running to essentially have your system run properly. So that's why I would not mess with any of those. But again, what's really nice is when there is a program or application that's using a pretty significant amount of like your CPU or memory, for instance, instead of being like a dark yellow, how it shows right here, it would actually be more of a orange or reddish tint, you know, and that's how you can tell, you know, this is using almost way too much you know, CPU or memory usage, I may have to shut this program down. Or if you know that program is going to use a lot more resources, then it's fine. Uh, it would still be orange or red. But you know, if it's not going to hurt your system in any way, if it's doing that, it may just need those resources while it's functioning. So again, just it's really simple to just select an app from here as well. And then you can click to end the task again. If it's red and it shouldn't be red and it's using way too much resources and it's slowing your system down, you can do that. Or again, if the application or program is just, you know, stalling and frozen, you can click it right here and click to end the task. So next, I'm going to talk about the actual performance tab and the startup tab now. Okay, so starting with the performance tab, you know, once you click the performance tab, it will show you an actual graph as well as the same kind of percentage of utilization of like your CPU, your memory, your hard drive, your network, and you could add other options here. You know, these are not the only four options that it shows. You can add if you had your own dedicated graphics card, you can add that here as well and some various other options. But, you know, again, this is really nice to go to if your system is really loud, you know, and it's getting really hot and you're like, well, why is this, you know, my CPU, you know, and other components being used a lot, you know, and that's when you can come to performance and see if it's being used, you know, a lot, if it's at like a 99 or a hundred percent, you know, it should not be at that. At least it shouldn't be at that for a long time. And same with your memory, you know, especially your memory. If you realize that, oh, you know, my system's fine when I'm only working on one or two things or have like my web browser open, just checking my email. But as soon as I actually, you know, open my email and I have Facebook open as well. I have other programs open and the more programs I have open, you know, the slower my system's getting, that's where you can come here and click on memory. And if your memory is at like 99 or a hundred percent usage, that is why, you know, your system seems fine when you're only using a couple things, but the more that you open up, that's when it gets slower. You know, the more memory you have, it allows you to have more things open at one time and still have really good performance. You know, so this is just really nice to just kind of see, you know, how well is the hardware in my computer system working? Is it working at like max capacity most of the time and various things like that? You know, so this is just something to go to, to take a quick look at, you know, these nice graphs to show you how much usage your components are, you know, being used in your computer system. Now, if you go to this tab right here, which is the startup tab. So what that means is this. Any programs or applications that are within this startup tab are programs and mostly services. Uh, so what a service is, is a program that's designed to constantly run in the background, you know, to support, again, certain applications or your computer system in general. So for instance, as you can see here, like the 
Realitech HD audio manager and this other HD audio background process. You know, these are used so that, you know, your actual audio of your computer system, the sound is working fine. You know, so that's why those have to start up. And what these do, and the reason why they're called startup programs is because as soon as you turn on your system and log into Windows, these are the programs that start up automatically and they will run in the background constantly to support these applications or your computer system. So if, you know, the reason why you would come to this tab is if you downloaded certain programs and applications and you've realized, especially on startup, your system is running slower, or if your system, you know, even after it's fully started up, it's still running slow, you can come here and it will tell you whether this, these programs and services are enabled, but also this is the main thing, the startup impact. If it's got a high impact, that means it's this service is using a lot of resources when it starts your system up and it continues to use a high amount of resources on your computer system while it's still running in the background. So if you ever you know, notice your computer system's running slow, you can go to this startup tab and see what services you have that start up as your computer first you know, turns on and you log into Windows and what you know, services you have running in the background to see what type of impact they have and if you can you know, disable them and lessen the impact right here so that your system is uh, working a lot better. And the last item on the agenda we're going to go over is Windows Defender, which is the built-in uh, security software for Windows 10 as well as Windows 8. I'm going to go over that next. All right, so next we are going to move on to Windows Security, and we're going to talk about all the major security tools that you would find built into the Windows 10 operating system. So first and foremost, if you were to have the main settings window open and you click the option that was it says update and security. This is the first window that it brings you to, which is Windows Update, which is really nice because here, you know, as you can see, check for updates, you can manually check for yourself whether you have the most current updates for Windows, which is really nice. And it will actually tell you the last time and day that it, the updates got checked. So the thing is, a lot of the time you don't have to worry about this because as I said, Windows should automatically be checking for these updates and download that, downloading them and installing them for you. So a lot of the times you don't have to worry about this, but this is just a nice way. You could always do it manually, check for updates, and then you can see if you have any updates and it will download and install automatically. Now, if you see right here, you can see it says future update for Windows 10 version 2004. So what these are, and you might get these, these are updates to Windows 10 that are much more extensive than your typical updates that you get for Windows. And these essentially change certain features of Windows 10. And not only that, but they could improve and have security improvements as you see right here. So the big thing is if they have security improvements, you should download them and install them. But if they don't and they just add different features, uh, the reason why they don't get downloaded and installed right away is because not everyone wants these specific new future updates and things like that. So, and, and what Microsoft has had issues with, uh, especially with Windows 10, is some of these features and updates that they do, they actually have quite a bit of issues to where they make things not function properly, they have issues with certain people's uh, systems, different types of systems that they have can definitely cause issues. And that's why, you know, it, it's a lot of these big future updates are manual and you have to download them and install them yourself because, you know, what they found is, you know, people get pretty pissed off when these big updates are just downloaded and installed automatically and then it's screwing their system up and you know you have this huge future update that's screwing these people's systems up and they didn't even ask and didn't even you know give full permission to have these huge updates so that's why some of these huge updates you know you have to download and install them manually but again if they have security improvements download and install them for sure and then a lot of these other options are self-explanatory we're not going to get into the advanced options but you know you can always view the update history and see if you miss certain updates you can change the active hours of when you know you want your system to actually update itself so it's not updating itself and having you know your system restart because a lot of updates or certain updates make it so you have to restart your system in order to properly apply them so this allows you to change the active hours of when it can do that and again you can actually pause updates so that they don't get updated right away they don't uh, they'll download but they won't install right away this is again 
for the main reason of just some of these updates may cause issues with your system. So some people would like to pause the updates before they fully install it. But next I'm gonna show you guys what happens if you go to the main Windows security tab right here, if you were to click this and the options that it brings up. All right, so when you click Windows security right here, this is what pops up. It shows all the major security mechanisms that Windows 10 has included within it. So what you're gonna see is you know virus and threat protection, you have your specific account protection and various features that help you to keep your accounts protected, firewall and network protection. You have app and browser control so that certain applications, you know, don't download and install pieces of viruses and malware, you know, onto your system without your knowledge. And same with browser control. So the main thing uh, that I'll say with this browser control, you know, a lot of the features that it has, you have to use Microsoft Edge you know, in order to actually get those features, you know, like if you're browsing the web and you want your web browser to alert you if a web page is suspicious or not, you know, with this specific one built into Windows 10, you do have to use Microsoft Edge uh, in that instance. And then they have certain device security features and things like that. And the way that you know that these are all enabled and functioning properly is with these check marks, you know, the green and the white check mark in them, it means they're enabled and they are functioning properly. And don't worry, you know, if ever one of these is not functioning properly or not enabled, it will be a red circle and then check mark within that red circle. And it would let you know immediately with tons of pop ups and things like that, that, you know, this is not enabled, you know, because you need to have these things enabled to properly protect your system. So I'm going to talk about first and get into more depth of virus and threat protection next. So here's the main window when you click specifically virus and threat protection. And as you can see, it will let you know when your last scan was, if any threats were found, and it will say how long the scan lasted and the amount of files it actually scanned. So typically by default, the automatic scans that Windows does are just the quick scans. And as you can see, it says in parentheses right here, quick scan. So if you want a more extensive test done, you can change that with the scan options. And Really, you know, it depends because if your system is working fine, quick scan is fine. It just quickly scans the most common files and folders and locations on your system that viruses will typically try to infect. But again, if your system has a reduction in performance and you feel as though your system might be infected with something, you can click scan options right here and it will give you much more extensive options to scan your system. So as you can see, you can change again the various virus and threat protection settings right here uh, the way you get updates as well and you could check manually for updates right here as well and ransomware protection which uh, you don't typically have to do anything and it will tell you like no action needed for these uh, you don't typically have to mess with anything that will be you know enabled by default but this is what happens if you click scan options you know what are your other options for scans so these are your main options for scans. Quick scan is what's on by default, and it just, again, checks folders in your system where threats are commonly found. But again, if your system is having issues and you feel like your system does have a virus or other piece of malicious software in it that a quick scan isn't finding, that's when you could do a full scan. Now this checks all the files and running programs on your hard drive and in your computer system. Now this scan, it depends on how much you actually have stored in your system, but it can take quite a long time now again if you have a lot of stuff stored in your computer system this can take up to an hour or even more than an hour you know if you have a lot in your system so that's when you can do this full scan and you know you can make sure your computer system is fully protected and there's no viruses in it now you can also do a custom scan which will allow you to choose the specific files and folders you know in various locations that you want to check but that's more for more advanced users who want to check specific locations so i wouldn't necessarily click that and touch that but then this fourth option is Windows Defender Offline Scan. So what this is, is essentially, as it says, some malicious software can be particularly difficult to remove from your device. Windows Defender Offline can help find and remove them using up-to-date threat definitions. This will restart your device and can take up to 15 minutes. So what this is, is this. Windows Defender Offline Scan will essentially try to help remove malicious software that's on your system that these normal scans cannot get. It basically is trying to remove viruses and other pieces of malicious software before your system actually loads Windows. So like when you it reboots the system, 
and before Windows actually fully gets loaded in your system, and before um, you're able to you know log into your Microsoft account and log into your Windows account and see the desktop, that's what this scan is for. Is it stops the, your system from fully loading Windows, and then it tries to get rid of viruses that are essentially loading themselves and running before Windows actually loads. So that's why uh, this is helpful and useful. Again, if you're really having issues with your system and these scans are not working, you can do the Defender offline scan to try to fix that issue. And again, you can change this. You know, If I choose one of these options, it allows me to scan now, but you'd have to go into the other options. You know, if instead of for automatic scanning, if you instead of you know wanted it uh, to be the full scan instead of the quick scan, you can change that here as well. So that's it for scan options. And if we go back to the home screen of Windows Security, you know, this is it. I'm just going to go over, you know, again, virus and threat protection and the scan options I just went over. That's all the depth I'm going to go into with security in general, because a lot of these options I would not touch, you know, as long as they have this check mark and the green around it, that means that they are enabled, they are functioning properly, and you're protected, you know. When it comes to the only other thing I would talk about is really, again, this browser control and the various security options that they have for the browser control. You know, again, you have to use Microsoft Edge in order to get the benefits of those security options. But again, it's not, you know, you don't, you're not forced to use Edge. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, and other web browsers are very nice and typically have their own built-in security features as well that can do a lot of the things that uh, Edge and these security options can do. So I wouldn't be worried about that. But that concludes my presentation. Now I'm going to actually go over and do a demonstration on my own desktop for you guys and go into a bit more depth of certain items and, you know, actually show you guys how to do the things that I just discussed.